actually put on my eye bone be comb vintage that my mammy wore 40 years ago at her wedding to pay homage to the Sylvester when I sit down and talk about you it. You okay. make me feel mighty Bugs. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share the Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. And if you are not already a part of this book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube and for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets now, it. Now, let's continue talking about Miss Ruth. Still so excited. Her life as a point assistant. As co-owner of Atlantic, Wexler had signed Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, Bob Dylan, Dusty Springfield. Dusty Springfield was that white lady that was like the Tina Marie back then, but she had some mental issues. Remember Murray Wells was like, that bitch is nuts. Led Zeppelin and Wilson Pickett. Wexler was an enormous booster of the Muscle Shoals sound and well-respected producer in his own right. But he couldn't get a handle on how to market my sisters, who specialized in a unique blend of jazz, scat, and bebop, and sometimes country, basically music of the 1930s and 40s, but now pop, folk, and rock music were in the saddle. Wexler sent them to Malaco Studios in Jackson, Mississippi, where they would cut a few songs under the then hot producer, Wardell, Quersicu, known to New Orleans musician as the Creole Beethoven. But the black Beethoven must have been tone deaf during those sessions because there was no fifth symphony in the works. They sounded stilted and lifeless. On my sister's first two records, they ended up sounding very similar to Honeycomb, a female trio that scored a million selling pop and R&B number one single in the spring of 1971 with Gonna Put It In The One That laid such a big egg with the record buying public that Atlantic dropped the Pointer Sisters in 1972. Listen. As much as El Diablo, that would be the Clive Davis, as much as El Diablo has the magic touch, he has laid some eggs. The same thing goes for Jerry Wexler. Jerry Wexler is amazing, an outstanding producer and music mogul. And I would say Clive Davis dropped his biggest ball with Phyllis Hyman, okay? I don't think he knew what to do with her. And because Whitney Houston was coming in, I think he just paid so much attention to her that he didn't realize the gold mine that Phyllis was. It was like he wanted to make Phyllis Hyman uh, something that she just wasn't. She was just soulful. That suffered with depression, but then most creators are the most depressed. I hate to say it, you know, except for Eric Badu, you know. She stay high. Okay, I ain't got time to be dealing with depression because I'm high. Or I'm turning some man into, you know, some kind of zombie. Getting back to Jerry Wexler. Jerry Wexler dropped the ball with the Pointer Sisters. You hear me? I don't, I don't think he just quite understood them, which is hard to believe. I'm like, it's the goddamn Pointer Sisters, baby. You don't know what to do with them. Thanks to David Rubinson, my sisters continued to get studio work backing others and every now and then I'd get a phone call telling me to rush to the studio because June wasn't up to performing. This is where we're going to get into the situation with June, okay? Um, 
You know, it could be one single event that pushes someone over the top. You know, I believe that June already had emotional issues, but when that certain event happens, boom. Women can recover from a date grape situation or not recover and just know how to control the emotion associated with date grape. But um, let's talk about it, okay? Because we know about this through Anita's book that we had previously read. June had major psychological issues stemming from an incident that occurred a few years earlier when she was gang great by a group of neighborhood thugs. It happened right in front of my daughter Fawn, who was around five years old at the time. June begged the men not to hurt Fawn, and they obliged. But what they did to June was brutal and sadistic. She actually knew her assailants, but never ratted them out to police out of fear of retaliation and that our older brothers, Aaron and Fritz, would take matters into their own hands. Okay, pause, let me take it back. Remember when the dude Larry was putting his hands on the sister Bonnie and Ruth, and I was like, why would the dude Larry do it? Because she got brothers. Who the hell reaches out to touch a woman that got brothers that would put that work in? And by her saying this, I'm like, okay, we, she's confirming that the brothers will put their work in, but why didn't the brothers say, wait a minute, whoa, 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 don't put your hands on my mother sisters. What's wrong with you? Taking it to June and her emotions at the time, I'm going to tell you that I've had a situation that happened before and I'm going to say that the reason why I did not report it to the police was because out of my ignorance I did not want to be considered a rat or a snitch. I was worried about retaliation against me and my family and um, me being the oldest I didn't want to put my younger brothers in a situation of trying to retaliate. My brothers know some things, but not all things now in our adult age. But um, what's funny is the guy who had uh, did something to me was doing it to all the girls in the neighborhood. He's not here on this earth no more. She actually knew her assailants, but never ratted them out to the police out of fear of retaliation and that our older brothers, Aaron and Fritz, would take matters into their hands. June bottled all that pain and trauma up inside her, which resulted in depression, addiction, and wild mood swings. Today, it would be called a classic case of bipolar disorder. June stopped going to school. My parents sought help in the form of a therapist who would come to the house. June rarely got out of bed for the sessions. When called to fill in for June, I'd get paid up to $100 for a session. And let me tell you, that made me the happiest bitch on the planet. It not only put food on the table and paid a few bills, but also gave me a sense of self-worth. And it sure beat the holy hell out of sitting in an office being a key punch operator for eight hours a day. I filled in for June on a Dr. Hook session, though I can't recall the song or album. Recycling the blues and other related stuff by Taj Mahal and most memorable Sylvester and the hot bands. Why was I born? Sylvester James Jr was the first openly gay man I ever met. And we clicked from the get-go. I keep threatening y'all that I'm gonna eventually do a video on Sylvester. I'm gonna be honest with you guys. Let me push this up, cause one of these titties fall out, I'm gonna be embarrassed. I'm gonna tell you why I'm bullshitting on uploading that video. I, I just feel like it has to be perfect. Like I have to have the perfect wig, the perfect outfit, today, today outfit. I actually put on my eye bone become vintage that my mammy wore. Let's see, 20, 40 years ago at her wedding to pay homage to the Sylvester when I sit down and talk about it. I've been threatening I'm going to do that Sylvester video for so long. I just, ow. It's like, I feel like I'm not worthy enough to talk about the Sylvester. You make me feel mighty real. 
man and then you got two tons of fun one day i'm gonna get enough nerve and i'm not gonna be so nervous to talk about sylvester y'all i just i don't i'm gonna get it together you make it be mighty real. let me tell you something the first time i heard sylvester i was probably 12 years old we was living in michigan park and I used to listen to the radio going to sleep, the quiet storm, in fact, okay? And I am telling you, Sylvester James was the first openly gay man I ever met. And we clicked from the get-go. I loved his gender funky gospel falsetto voice. Me too. I've been looking around and you were here all the time. We're going to pretend that I hit that, okay? And besides, I was born a sucker for a finger-snapping man in drag. He was fun, campy, sometimes diva-ish, and totally glam and glitter way before David Bowie, T-Rex, or Roxy Music. So we know this story from when we read the Anita Pointer book that, you know, uh, when David Bowie came down there to sing, and uh, the story goes, they was like, hey, David Bowie, how you like it down here in the California? He was like, you don't need me. Y'all already got Sylvester. Y'all ain't impressed with my ass. No, I mean, I love the David Bowie, but baby, you, well, I mean, it's fucking Sylvester. The man who would be crowned the queen of disco wore sequined hot pants and a mess of wildly patterned scarves and bling. When Sylvester performed, anything went. One time, my sisters backed him at a show in a Castro district warehouse where live chickens roamed the stage, a man jumped through a flaming hoop, and male and female streakers ran up and down the aisles. It was quite the spectacle. It was through my friendship with Sylvester that I got to see and experience the gay community up close and meet a lot of sweet and tender human beings who'd been cut off from their families and society in general. One in particular went by the name of Pristine Condition who was a member of the San Francisco Psychedelic Theater troupe called the Cockettes. He loved us to death. Thank God it's better today, but I still see a lot of that, and it bothers me to no end. It's no secret the gay community has always rallied around and supported the Pointer Sisters, and they are, by God, family to us. The good Lord loves all of us, his children, and created us all equal. Even though our society has evolved and moved forward in our acceptance of the gay community, we've not fully evolved. I like to see that happen in my lifetime. I wish Sylvester had. He died of AIDS in 1988. God rest his beautiful, untamed soul. That hurt me. I'm not lying. That shit hurt me. Talking about fabulousness. In early 1972, Bill Graham and David Rubinson parted ways and the Pointer Sisters followed David to his new production company, David Rubinson and Friends. He signed them to Blue Thumb Records, a Beverly Hills-based record label founded by Bob Krasnow. Tommy LaPuma and Don Graham. While they were an independent label, Blue Thumb had some street cred with a roster featuring acts such as Ike and Tina Turner, Captain Beefheart, Buddy Guy, Albert Collins, Dave Mason, T-Rex, and Dan Hicks and the Hot Licks. I don't even recollect the circumstances of when I first sang for David, but he once told a reporter, Roof came in, sang a low A, and I just went out of my mind. Right. He immediately proposed to make the Pointer Trio a quartet, even though at the time most successful girl groups came in triplicate. The Supremes, Duranette and Martha Reeves and the Bandellas. I was 26 years old and really didn't have anything to lose. I had two kids to support and no husband and was living mostly on my meager income and whatever Uncle Sam decided to kick in. 
Singing was something I loved, and that came naturally to me. So when my sisters asked me to join them permanently, it was a no-brainer. In December 1972, I tendered my resignation at Pacific Far East Lines and officially joined the Pointer Sisters. Within six months, the welfare queen would give up her throne for a new title, Pop Princess. Just so that you know me.